Um, let me point out where we are in the class. So um, we've done essentially two thirds. We've done the, the part on classical thermodynamics and, and given you the formalism. And I've, I've quite deliberately separated that from the more applied side of thermodynamics because I feel otherwise people get very confused by what is actual formalism of thermodynamics, which is sort of all, which is always true versus what is model building like ideal gas or ideal solutions and so. So we did that uh, then we delved into statistical mechanics to see, to understand the, the microscopic underpinning of what these quantities are in thermodynamics. And now we're coming to the third part, which is sort of putting this together. And, and this will mainly focus on the theory of mixtures, uh, mixtures will, which will lead to multi-phase equilibrium. So multiple phases in equilibrium with each other, which is typically what uh, real materials are about. That leads us into phase diagrams. And in between, we will talk about uh, model building, uh, how we build either simple models or more uh, elaborate models for mixtures. Um, uh, and their applications. Um, the theory of mixtures is also called solution theory, which can be a little misleading because I think when you talk about solutions, people think of liquid solutions as in sort of chemistry. Uh, we will use that term and you will see that term in books and chapters that we assign, uh, but it's probably better to think of it as the theory of mixtures, right? What happens when you put a lot of components together and they form maybe one phase or multiple phases. How do you describe the equilibrium and their properties? Um, some of the basic formalism that I'll give you today is kind of, it's probably been covered in undergraduate courses. So I'll just go through it again. Uh, if you've missed it in undergraduate courses, uh, you can sort of brush up on it in the Hof, um, which is an undergraduate textbook. Uh, there it's uh, chapter eight in the Hof. Uh, we will mainly use uh, Gordon uh, which is sort of a nice nifty little book on uh, solution theory and phase diagrams. Uh, it's so old, it's out of print. So we have the PDFs online. Um, we'll be working our way through chapter four, parts of five, and then later we'll do uh, some of the other chapters. The other chapters are the application of solution theory uh, to phase diagrams. Okay, so that's where we are. Um, So our, our objective of really pretty much the rest of the course is um, the rigorous descriptions of multi-phase solutions. Sorry, I should say multi-phase systems. So we will be looking at something I sort of make it abstract here, right? There will be a, a, a system that has multiple phases. Uh, I'll typically use Greek letters to denote phases. Um, so I'll call them alpha, beta, and gamma. And I'll use Norman, uh, uh, normal Arabic indices for uh, like I, J, K for um, species. So what we will want to know for these multi-phase mixtures, the questions we'll be sort of asking is, um, first of all, what how do you describe the properties of each phase as a function of composition? And how do you rigor do that rigorous description? So function, I'll, I'll write composition just sort of a set of mole fractions here, right? To make that a little shorter. Um, what are the properties of the total system? as a function of its composition. And the, if these phases do not have the same composition, then the composition of the total system will be some, some average of that. And, and then most importantly, how will we describe equilibrium in such a system? And answer questions like, why does a system not always form a single phase? Why does it prefer to often separate into um, different phases? So the first thing we wanna do is, is 
come up with a formalism to describe the properties of each phase as a function of solution. So a rigorous um, way to, uh, let me sort of isolate one phase. And I wanna figure out how to describe the properties of this as a function of its composition. So uh, first a bit of nomenclature to generalize this. So let's say that the content of this of the number of moles of each species is sort of a, a set of mole numbers, right? Um, then uh, I will use um, some of these mole numbers I will describe as n total. And we will define normalized properties like say G with an underscore as G of the total system uh, divided by n total. And same for you know things like H and U, right? It will be defined similarly. So this is, you, you will find that this is sometimes a bit of an odd definition because uh, you know, this phase alpha here could contain, you know, atoms and big molecules all together. So my n total is truly the sum of um, these things together. Uh, sometimes there's some ambiguity how I define that because, um, you know, let's say I have an intermetallic that forms an intermetallic compound and that's of composition A to B. Do I count this as uh, three moles or do I count this as one mole, right? So when you do your formalism rigorously, it doesn't actually matter, but you will have just have to think a bit about it. Um, we will adopt the most conventional definition that if you work in um, what I would call condensed matter, so small molecule species, um, that we will count essentially each atom separately. So this would be three moles of stuff. If I have one mole of the compound, this would be three moles of stuff. That will be our, our classical definition. This is obviously quite different in organic chemistry, right? If you have a system that can, contains CH4 uh, and one mole of CH4, you don't count it as, as five moles, right? You could say it's five moles of atoms, but typically we, people will call it one mole. So how you normalize here it, it, it is a bit uh, ambiguous sometimes. But again, thermodynamics will work as long as you sort of work consistently through it. Um, but when we work in solutions of sort of atomic species, not molecular species, we will almost always count the number of moles of, of total atoms in whatever physical form they uh, appear together. So to, to figure out how systems change as a function of composition, you can simply uh, evaluate um, what you need to know about the variation of the thermodynamic potentials now as a function of the amount of stuff uh, you put into them. For example, now if you write out U, the internal energy, which as you remember, has as variables the extensive property. So in its most simple form, that's the entropy and the volume. But now if we consider it to have variable content, that's also the mole numbers, right? So before when we only talked about closed systems, N is a parameter, and now we will actually treat it more as a variable, which means that if you write the differential du, there is a term that comes from possible variations in the mole numbers and the, the intensive parameter, the conjugate intensive parameter is the chemical potential, which here, since U is a function of N has this, this, in, this chemical potential has to be defined as DU, the NI. So this is an I here at constant, um, S, V, and other mole numbers. Okay. So you can carry that through in the other Legendre transforms, right? You can, you know, remember that H is uh, U plus PV. So in the differential, you're simply going to carry this, this mu DNI over. And so you can keep on going with F, right? But the one we actually care about is G.
Uh, notice that I'm not Legendre transforming with respect to the mu n's, right? So that means that this differential looks exactly the same. This differential looks exactly the same in every potential. So if I do this here, if I write the differential of G now, it's the same as before, minus SDT plus VDP, but now I carry with me the mu i, the n i, right? So I'm now looking explicitly at how the free energy can change as a function of g. And if I look at this differential here, what, how is the chemical potential defined now? Mu is defined as the derivative of g with respect to n i at constant temperature, pressure, and n j. So there are many different definitions of mu, right? Because so here it's defined as the derivative of the internal energy with respect to N, but at constant S and V. Here it's defined as a derivative of G, but with constant T and P. And I could have done the same for H and F, right? I could have written out the differential of H and F, and I would have found that I would have something like if I did the diff if I did this for f, what would I have gotten? Right, I would have gotten that mu i is the f, the n i, and that would have been under constant T V and n j. Right, this is all the same chemical potential. Right, it just defined as a different derivative here. So let me bring this back, this expression back on the other board, since it's kind of the important quantity. So the chemical potential is the change in free energy as I add species at constant temperature and pressure and keeping the number of the number of moles of the other uh, species fixed. So an important thing to know is that the the total number of moles is not constant here, right? Because I'm keeping all the NJ constant, but I'm adding NI. So here, n total is not constant. Keep that in mind because it's sort of a classic here. This chemical potential truly is this action, right? I have a system. I'm adding an amount of, uh, of species Ni, an infinitesimal amount of Ni. What's the resulting dg? Right? That's what this chemical potential answers is how much does the free energy change as I add some species Ni. Very often what you actually want in material science is you want to look at the effect of composition changes on free energy. So composition change is different, right? In a composition change, I change, let's say I do a binary, I change A for B. So I replace some A by B, that's a composition change. So in that case, the total number of moles is constant. So what is the relevant chemical derivative there? So if you replace A by B, then the two variations, DNA and DNB are linked, right? I'm taking some A away and that's replaced by B or vice versa, right? And this leads to DNA total equals zero. So if I write out the change in free energy for a binary system, 
you know, I get minus SDT, it's really nothing here, plus VDP, plus mu A, the NA, I'll do it very explicitly right now, the NB. But if I'm imposing only a composition change, then what I get here, DNA and DNB are related. So this becomes mu B minus mu A times DNB. Right? Because these, these two terms collapse into one. So, and this is a B. So you can now calculate the compositional derivative of the free energy because this term here, so mu B minus mu A has to be equal to the derivative of G with respect to DNB. And now this is at constant T and P, but because of what I have imposed here, this is also at constant and total. So because in total is constant, I can derive in the differential by in total because in total is not changing, right? I cannot do this here, right? Do not make that mistake, right? In this derivative, I cannot divide by in total because in total itself is changing in the definition of the chemical potential. But in this construction, I can. So now what do I get? I get that mu B minus mu A is a derivative of the normalized G, so the G per mole. So is the derivative of the free energy per mole and NB over in total is the mole fraction. So this is an important result that if you are given data as a function of composition, it's by definition normalized per mole. So the total number of moles is staying constant. That derivative is not the chemical potential. It's the, it's the difference between the two chemical potentials. And we'll come back to that uh, many, many times. Because the chemical potential will, of course, be crucial knowing the chemical potential as a function of composition because the chemical potential, um, as you can already guess, is what will determine equilibrium. Um, as an aside, there's an important relation between um, uh, chemical potentials and the free energy, which is in some sense even simpler than that derivative relation, which you can get through the Euler relation, which we derived uh, a while ago, where we derived that U is TS minus PV plus some I uh, mu I N I, right? We derived that in general for all the extensive quantities. So if I plug that in the definition of G, which is U plus PV minus TS. So if I plug that in, I find a sort of re quite remarkable relation that the free energy is simply the weighted, the molar weighted sum of chemical potentials. So not only is the chemical potential, the derivative of the free energy physically you can think of it as the contribution that a species, in this case, I, makes to the free energy. So what I'm really saying is I have a, a system of three species, A, B, and C, and I know the three chemical potentials, I actually know the free energy because the chemical potential is the contribution to the free energy, right? That's what the Euler relation tells us here. So if we introduce new variables, um, we will have new equations of state, right? Because remember the equation of state is the conjugate variable 
the, the dependence of the conjugate intensive variable on the extensive variables in U, but in G it's a little different. So what's the new information we're going to need to describe the composition dependence of the free energy? I realize I'm writing many times um, the same equation down. So remember that these are the first two equations of state, right? So getting S as a function of T and P is the first equation of state. V as a function of T and P is the mechanical equation of state. But now what you see is that since mu is the first derivative of G, there is a third equation of state or or I guess as many new ones as there are species, which is that you wanna know mu i as a function of t, p, and all the n, j. And I wanna be a little careful with notation. Um, if I just write generically n i here, you might think that's only i, the same index as the chemical potential, but this is really all the composition variables, right? So all mole numbers. And why is this equation of state so important? Because again, we will later see, and you probably already know, right? That equilibrium will be set by the chemical potentials of species. And this is the essential equation that relates chemical potential to composition, right? If you're at fixed temperature and pressure, then we're basically saying here, the chemical potential depends on composition. And you can figure that out if you knew the free energy because it would be a derivative of the free energy. So, so this is the equations of state. Uh, there are also new properties that are introduced. And if you remember, the definition of properties is that they are the second derivatives of the free energy. And this is sort of a good recap of classical thermo. Remember if you have, if you look at the Hessian here, sort of the matrix of second derivatives, you sort of remember what the second derivatives are with respect to temperature and pressure, right? You know, there's are things like heat capacity and thermal expansion and compressibility and so. So um, we now have, for every Ni, we're going to have new second derivatives, right? We have like, how many do we have? We have three, right? Because this matrix, as you know, is symmetric because of the Maxwell relations. So let's have a look at what they are. Okay, let's uh, pick out this one. What is that property? So the first derivative with respect to T, that's S. So this property here is well, it's minus s, right? So this property is minus ds, the ni at constant tp and nj. So it's how the entropy changes as I add species i, keeping everything else constant, okay? So uh, this has a name, uh, it's called the partial molar entropy of I. And it's written as a bar on top. So it's written with the bar on top to distinguish it from the molar entropy, right? Um, S defi with a bar below would be the entropy per mole. This is the partial molar entropy and is defined as the derivative of S with respect to Ni. So, you can do the other ones, right? If you do this one, the first derivative with respect to pressure is the volume. So now I have the derivative of the volume with respect to Ni at Tp and J. And that is called the partial molar volume and is written as V bar I. It's the volume increase as I add an I. 
And then the diagonal element, right, as always is some kind of, physically is some kind of capacitance. So first derivative with respect to ni is mu. So this is the derivative d mu i d n i at constant t p n and j. Um, and this one is actually not called a partial molar quantity. Um, uh, this one actually doesn't have a name, but if you sort of see what it is, right, I would actually rewrite it as one over d n i d mu i. And this, I think if you look at it carefully, you could think about what it is, right? Whenever we see a term like this is a capacitance, right? And, and you can almost think of this as a chemical capacitance. Which I'll have to admit to you is not a conventional name. There is no conventional name for this. But think about it, right? If I substitute other variables here, what do I get, right? If I take another conjugate couple, you know, if I were to do this uh, for charges, then the extensive quantity is Q, the charge, the conjugate is the potential. So then it's the electrical capacitance, right? Um, if I do the magnetization and the applied field, then it's a susceptibility. So this chemical capacitance is essentially telling you like, you know, how much NI can I stuff in until my chemical potential goes up, right? It's telling me something about how the reservoir responds to adding NI stuff to it, right? Okay. Um, in general, there's a general definition of a partial molar quantity So for any extensive quantity, I can define the partial molar quantity of a species, and it's the derivative of X with respect to the number of moles of that species at constant temperature pressure and, and keeping the other mole numbers constant. So there's one, there's one thing you have to remember is that when you talk about a partial molar quantity, there are three relevant things to think about. It's a bit of a simple symbol, but it contains, it refers to, there are three, uh, I would say, parts to it. There's the chemical species, right? So it is the partial molar quantity of some species, like silver, gold, methane, whatever, right? Uh, it, it's a particular partial molar quantity, that's X, right? So it's maybe partial molar volume or partial molar entropy or whatever. And it's in a solution, in a mixture, right? So it's in a mixture with a bunch of other things. So three, if you see a symbol like this, right? Partial molar quantity, there are three things you gotta pay attention to, right? What's the chemical species I'm referring to? Well, what's the quantity? That's the easier one. And in what mixture is it? And the reason that this will get confusing is that we will often look at multiphase mixtures and each of them will have a different partial molar quantity. So if I may summarize, that when you look explicitly at the composition dependence of the free energy that the property matrix is now extended. From what we had here, which is um, minus CP over T. Here we had minus beta T times V. Here we have alpha times V. So the volumetric thermal expansion, alpha times V. And now here we have minus the partial molar entropy. Here we have the partial molar volume. This is the same because the matrix is diagonal. Sorry, it's not diagonal, it's symmetric. And then here we have one over what I'll simply refer to as the chemical capacitance. But this is kind of a symbol that I've been uh, invented here.
you can prove easily that there are new Maxwell relations, and I'm going to mostly let that up to you. But for example, you can prove that the partial molar volume is dv dni at constant p and other things constant. And if you look carefully at the differential that I've written up here, this differential, if I take the derivative of v respect to ni, remember that because of the Maxwell relation, because of the symmetry of the free energy, this has to be equal to the derivative of the chemical potential with respect to pressure. So this is also equal to d mu i dp. So the partial molar volume doesn't just tell you how the volume changes. It's actually also the relevant quantity that makes you understand how chemical potential of that species changes with pressure. You can do the same for the partial molar entropy, right? If I, what's the partial molar entropy going to tell me about the chemical potential? I think about it, you should probably have an intuitive sense of that by now, right? And if you don't have an intuitive sense, look here, right? Somebody's unmuting, that's a good sign. It should be, sorry, what it be is response to temperature. Yeah, right, because the partial molar quantity is the derivative of this, so in this case, S with respect to N. So that has to be the same as the derivative of mu with respect to T. That is what the Maxwell construction is. So the partial molar entropy will give us information. It will actually be minus the mu i, the temperature. Okay. So very important, right? Because when we look at equilibria between solutions, we will want to know like, well, how does the equilibrium composition between two phases change with temperature? That depends on how the chemical potential changes with temperature. And that's going to, in turn, be determined by the relative the partial molar entropy. Um, so I want to do a, um, a simple example to, to try to give you a sense of this. So partial molar quantities, um, if you can determine them, they give you enormous physical insight. They're sort of a bit underappreciated in thermodynamics. And I think we often have the right-hand side, like we often do a lot of work figuring out, oh, how does equilibrium change with temperature? How does it change with pressure? And, and we usually forget that we can work backward, that that tells us the partial molar quantity and through the Maxwell relations, something else. And I wanna show you that that something else often gives you um, really useful physical insight. And I'm gonna do that sort of with, a toy example. So the toy example is going to deal with partial molar volume. So I am going to mix uh, large atoms, and I'm going to exaggerate a bit, right, with small atoms. Um, so let me start, like, let's say I made a crystal of large A atoms. Um, I need colors. So let's say that B fits completely in an interstitial. So what is the partial molar volume of B when XA equals one? What is that? So I'm asking you the question, 
I have a crystal of pure A or a system of pure A and I'm adding B to it, right? In the dilute limit because I am at X A equals one. What's the par partial molar volume of B? Given what I've told you, it goes in the interstitial perfectly. So it's zero, right? Because the partial molar volume is how I grow the total volume as I add B. So if it doesn't really expand the system, so uh, in this case, in this toy system, this is zero. What is the partial molar volume of A when XA is one? So I'm asking you, I have this crystal of A, there's nothing else, and I add A to it. That's just the same as the molar volume, right? Because all I'm doing, I'm adding a mole of A to it. So it's, I'm growing the crystal just by um, the molar volume. And then you can start thinking, right? How about you think about this one? What is the partial molar volume of A when X, when X A is zero? So in pure B, I'm gonna let you figure that out. So um, partial molar volumes can be positive or negative. Um, uh, again, volume of course is always a positive quantity but partial molar volume is a derivative of that quantity. So um, a classic example of a negative partial molar quantity is uh, water uh, when you add magnesium sulfate, MgSO4. Um, if you plot the volume as a function of the amount of magnesium sulfate you've added, uh, the volume actually initially goes down and then sort of starts to come back up. So there's a regime where it's kind of cool you add something to water and you shrink it. So in this case, the partial, when you're in this regime, the partial molar volume of magnesium sulfate in water is negative. And why is that? And this is the point I'm trying to make. Usually the partial molar quantities are about as close as you're gonna get in thermodynamics to telling you something about the physics of what's going on. What's really going on is that, so as you know, magnesium sulfate is a salt, it dissociates in water. And then you have magnesium two plus, which is a very small ion uh, with high charge or high charge densities. And what really happens is that magnesium two plus um, attracts H2O to it. Uh, because this has delta negative on it, right? And it pulls the water literally closer together than it was without the magnesium. So it has an overall negative effect on the volume uh, of the water. And, and that effect is so pronounced that it actually compensates for the fact that, of course, somewhere here, a sulfate two minus ion has to swim around too, right? Um, so uh, negative partial molar volumes are quite uh, common uh, in materials with sort of strong Coulombic or ionic interactions. Um, I have in, um, maybe I can quickly show it to you. I have a, um, I just show the chat, chat window. Um, I have, um, I'm totally distracted. Um, I'm not sure I know what my favorite one is. Um, okay, I'm totally distracted. Oh, come on. Okay. Um, 
So for example, um, here you see, this is actually the molar volume of, uh, uh, it's actually not the molar volume, it's the volume of a unit cell, but of course that's sort of is proportional to the molar volume, right? As a function of the amount of lithium you put in lithium nickel oxide. Um, and you know, it's sort of remarkable, right? You actually add lithium to it, to the system and the volume actually goes down. So again, this is a case of a negative partial molar volume of lithium. Uh, and, and the reason of course, is that you add lithium to the system. Uh, lithium is positively charged. So it essentially attracts the oxygen closer together and it shrinks the material. Um, and this is kind of important because uh, this is essentially the parent compound of a lot of battery materials. And so the way battery materials operate is that they cycle lithium in and out. Um, and in this case, uh, it's very important to know what the volume changes of these materials because in the battery you have strong mechanical effects because lithium goes in and out one electrode and goes in and out the other electrode. So you get overall very strong mechanical effects and they are determined by these partial uh, molar volumes. Okay. Not good. Just dropped my iPad. Anyway. So let me kind of summarize in terms of formalism where we are. So we've looked at the dependencies of the thermodynamic potentials on, you could say on composition, but in general on mole numbers, right? So that in introduces new equations of state and the new equations of state are the chemical potentials. And, and new properties, these are what's called PMQs or partial molar quantities, um, which describes the species in the mixture. Right, it describes their behavior in the mixture. Sorry, I should have stayed there because you're writing, sorry. Sorry, kind of white pose. Okay, next part, you got it? Tell me when I need to go back, right? You guys are very quiet. Okay, important part, which you probably already know, but just to make sure I'm gonna redo it. Equilibrium between mixtures. So equilibrium in multiphase So between mixtures in a system. So what's the, the physical situation here? We have a system, I'll first just do it with two phases. They can, overall, it's closed with respect to mass, but it's at constant T and P. But mass can flow inside the system. So it can partition between the two phases. Okay, so At the risk of being boring, I'm gonna rederive what we did in the first part of the course. But you knew that all so well, so that was a jab. Um, so maybe it's not boring. Okay, so the system as a whole, this is where you have to pay attention. The next five minutes is where you have to pay attention, okay? Um, 
the system as a whole is at constant temperature and pressure, and the system as a whole is closed, right? Each of the phases is not closed, but the sum of the two is closed. So what do we minimize? So G total, which is G alpha plus G beta, this should be minimal. Okay, this is very important, right? G alpha is not minimal, neither is G beta. It's the sum of the two, because that's the thing that is closed. You know, you think this is stupid to tell you, right? There will be at least five of you who tell me that equilibrium is in the minimum of G for a phase. Trust me, I know this. So it is not G alpha or G beta that we minimize. It's the sum of the two. And why? Because alpha is not closed, right? So the relevant thermodynamic potential to minimize, to find the equilibrium of alpha is not G, right? Because alpha can exchange stuff. You would have to do a Legendre transform with respect to the chemical potential to find a potential that minimizes alpha, same for beta. But if I take them together, they are closed. So I'm gonna minimize the sum of the two and you'll see that will be totally brilliant. And remember, you remember how to do this, right? DG total is DG alpha plus DG beta. And you've done this ad nauseum preparing for exam one. So um, if I'm at constant temperature and pressure, I'm gonna leave out those terms, right? So I get, um, this is some I, mu I in alpha. So we're gonna get a lot of indices, right? So this is the chemical potential of I in phase alpha. And this is what I told you, right? A partial molar quantity has a quantity index, that's its mu here that we're looking at, a species I, and an indication of where it is, in which solution. And that case is alpha here, okay. You know, if you watch the video later, you could just fast forward, but you can't do that with a live lecture, right? So that's DG total. And now since the system as a whole is closed, I know that DNI alpha has to be minus DNI beta. Right, so what flows in alpha has to come out of beta. And that allows me to rewrite this in terms of one set of variations. So this is some i, mu i alpha minus mu i beta times dni alpha. And so the only condition when I cannot lower the Gibbs free energy is when these things are zero. So these things are zero. So what you're finding is that the equilibrium condition is that mu i in alpha has to be mu i in beta for all i. So physically what I'm saying here, the chemical potentials have to be homogeneous, right? For each species that moves between the two phases, chemical potential has to be the same in alpha and beta, because if it's not, the species is just gonna move to where its chemical potential is lower and thereby reduce the free energy, right? Very simple. So I am gonna write this down explicitly, what you should remember about this. So then we can go back to listening to music. Okay, since you normally, in your notes, you don't write down the things I say, you only write down the things I write on the board. So I'm gonna write it down. Neither G alpha, I think you use nor then, right? Neither G alpha nor G beta is minimal. Right? Only, T total is minimal. I could have solved this in another way. You know, this is so annoying about thermal, right? 
your instructor always said, ah, you could solve this in three different ways and it'll give the same answer and sort of like riddles, right? So you could have also solved this. This is to challenge you by treating each phase as open with some external chemical potential. with a common external chemical potential. And the reason is transitivity of equilibrium, right? If this phase is in equilibrium with the external environment, and this phase is in equilibrium with the external environment, then the two have to be in equilibrium with each other. So how would you do that, right? You would do a Legendre transform of the free energy because you would not explicitly optimize uh, alpha with respect as an open system with respect to the environment and the same for beta. And you would find that the same condition would hold that these chemical potential would have to be the same. And maybe something that's uh, more of a, a tidbit is it's kind of obvious, but there is no equilibrium condition for non-mobile species. And this is how you can often sort of, in a kind of discrete way, um, include kinetics. So sometimes you might be at a temperature where some species can move, but not other ones. And so then your equilibrium is just under conditions where like say, you know, J is frozen, J cannot move, um, and you impose chemical tensions on I. Um, Usually that does not lead to the same equilibrium and as it should not, right? So what, what remains to do for us? Because in some sense, we have everything we need to know, right? Uh, we have the equilibrium conditions. The only thing is that this is not a very practical equilibrium condition because the way we think of as engineers and scientists of equilibrium is you know, this composition in alpha is in equilibrium with this composition in beta. So what we really have to do is turn this into composition, right? So we have to find the dependence of these. We have to turn this into a, a, an equation, a constraint on compositions, right? So how do we do that? We have to find how the chemical potential depends on composition, that's the equation of state, right? So the rest, I hate to say, of many lectures is figured out how chemical potentials behave with composition. Right, so to make this practical, Okay, let me give a jab at physicists. So this is where physicists would stop, right? They would tell you the problem is solved. I can exactly describe equilibrium, but as an engineer, the problem is not solved, right? To be honest, the hard work comes now is how does mu i depend on composition? And to be honest, this is the holy grail of material science, right? If you know chemical potentials as a function of composition, you know everything. And I will tell you how to do this in some limited way, but first an intermezzo, which is remarkable. So get the drum roll ready, Jen Yang. Um, if you, we have derived the Gibbs Duhem equation. Do you remember that? No, you don't, right? Do you remember? Or did I forget to do it this year? Was I so enthralled by other things? Did I derive the Gibbs-Duhem equation? Good. 
See, this is the difference between graduate students and undergrads. Undergrads always say, no, I don't remember. Um, but so I did derive the Gibbs to him equations, good. Uh, so I can just write it down. The Gibbs to him equation tells me that there's a relation between the variations of intensive variables. Oops, not correct. And again, that may not strike you as anything particularly useful, but if I'm at constant temperature and pressure, which is normally what I care about, right? So then it's telling me that there's something going on with the chemical potentials at constant temperature and pressure. It tells me that the variations of chemical potential are related. Aha. I'm gonna rewrite that in a more explicit form. So if I pick out one chemical potential, I'll call it mu one. And of course I realize one is not a good number because it looks like I. So I'm gonna use J for the other ones. So mu I is minus, so sorry, D mu I is minus some, I'm sorry, I'm using J now, J going from two to whatever species I have, N J, divided by n1 d mu j, right? That's just rewriting that equation. What is this telling me? It's telling me that if I know how the chemical potential of all species varies, all species minus one, right? that I can solve this differential equation and I can get the chemical potential of the other one, right? Because that's what this is, right? This is a differential equation. These chemical potentials depend on composition. I have composition variables here and this depends on composition too. So this is a differential equation in compositional space that you could in principle solve. But it actually gets better. It turns out that you can prove and whenever I say one can prove, that means I'm not proving for you, that if in a species with N components, if you know one chemical potential as a function of all of composition domain, you can actually figure them all out. This is a strong statement, right? If I have a system with five components, what I'm saying is if I just know even one chemical potential as a function of the whole composition domain, I can know all of them. So this is proven in lupus, which is on the reading list. It's a sort of terrible proof. Um, you know, he does it sort of semi-graphical, semi, it's like he spends three pages on it. Um, a few years ago, a student came up to me with a better proof, and I think it was only like five lines long, but I lost it. So maybe this is a challenge to you. Um, then maybe, in years after you, I will prove it to the students. Um, but, but it's an important statement, right? So, um, and, and we'll see later how we use this uh, because this actually has some practical use. Okay, so our job for the rest of this lecture and for the next few years is figuring out how chemical potential varies with composition. So how would you do that? So there are fundamentally three ways to get that information. One old fashioned, one boring and one exciting, but difficult. Where's my pen? Okay. So we need mu i as function of composition, right? I'll just write composition as sort of xj, right? That's our job. Well, it turns out you can get that from experimental measurements. And I'll show you later how.
turns out you can measure chemical potentials either from measured solubilities, you can measure it from vapor pressures, you can measure it electrochemical. And I'll show you a little more explicitly how that's done uh, later. Um, the second way is you can build simple models And we will do that. And then, of course, you could get it these days what's called ab initio, right? Which is you have now seen statistical mechanics. I could, in principle, you know, calculate the free energy from the partition function. And for the partition function, I need to know states, right? And, you know, you could do quantum mechanics here right to get energies of states and to do this sum here to do this you would do statistical mechanics and that's done today right that's my field that's my job and a few other people in the department do that today and it's remarkable how good you can be so you start from quantum mechanics you you do some stat mech to kind of thermally equilibrate the thing and then you get free energies and the derivatives are chemical potential right but unfortunately, I'm not going to teach that in class here. You have to take 215 for that whenever it's offered. OK. So sadly, uh, the first thing we're going to do is simple models, which uh, is part of a class that students uh, experience as boring. Um, but I have my friend to liven it up. So I will do my best to make this more exciting, this part. OK. But otherwise, I have tactically divided this between two classes. So we only have to fill 18 minutes now. Um, and then we will take some of the boredom up on Monday. So in the simple models are pervasive in the thermodynamics literature and in general material science. So you will encounter them. So you know, you can't be from Berkeley if you don't know what you're talking about. So especially uh, when you don't know what activity means. And I know for activity for you, many of you means a lot of things that have nothing to do with thermodynamics, but in thermodynamics it has a particular meaning. And uh, uh, activity is a transformation um, of the chemical potential, but I'll come to later what it really is. So it turns out that um, in models, people write the chemical potential as a function of temperature and pressure and composition. And again, when I write xj, and the j is not the same as the i here, I mean all the composition variables, right? Whereas the chemical potential here for a specific i um, is written as the chemical potential in some uh, reference state. the same temperature and pressure. But if you thought that you got away with this, um, AI actually depends on the composition XJ. This here is called, okay, so this is what you want, right? And we can talk about what that reference state is in many cases, uh, plus this correction that's RT log the activity. The reference state can be anything, but often it is uh, pure, the pure state for I at the same temperature and pressure. But you don't have to. Um, now, there's something funny here. So this has temperature and pressure dependence. You're picking some of that up in the reference state. But the question is, can this be rigorously correct all the time? Because you're picking up a particular temperature dependence on the composition dependence, right? Because this has no composition dependence, right? So you're picking up some temperature dependence in here. But this can still not fully represent any function here. and so. Technically, 
the activity relation is parameterized by T and P. So, which is really kind of technically saying that this depends here on T and P as well. And then of course, the right hand side, if there's a T and P dependence here, the right hand side can completely represent any function uh, on the left hand side. So why is this done this way? Because there's a hope, and as we know, hope is a town somewhere, but not a strategy. Um, there's a hope that the most of the temperature and pressure dependence sits in reference state. And that's actually very often true. So that this has weak temperature and pressure dependence. So you can use this between from one temperature uh, to the other. Um, so activity is defined through this equation. So activity is whatever makes this equation correct. So what have we done? The truth is we have done nothing, but if I can be a little facetious, um, activity is a transfer of ignorance, right? Basically, first, I didn't know the chemical potential. Now I just rewrote it as another function, but now I don't know the activity. So that's my, tr my, my transfer of ignorance, right? But the hope, and of course, I wouldn't do this if some of that hope wasn't real, is to capture the strong temperature and pressure dependence, or most of it, My colleagues in the department would fire me if I didn't tell you a subtlety, which many people care so much about, is that some this is written in between the two equations. Okay? So sometimes this is written as ui as a function of temperature, pressure, and xj is written as mu i not as a function of t p not plus r t log the activity as a function of p and x j so spot the difference here the reference state is at the same pressure as the pressure where i'm considering the system right here, the reference state is at a different pressure. And therefore, it's not called a reference state, but it's technically called a standard state. Don't ask me who came up with these no names. I don't know what standard and reference and, but this is called a standard state. And this is called a reference state. This is actually more used for gases where like, oh, I want to know the thing at 50 bar and I have a standard state at uh, one bar or one atmosphere. Personally, I couldn't care less. Um, I couldn't care less whether you call it reference or my state or standard state, as long as you know what you're doing, okay? So the main point here, the, the, the takeaway is that if you talk about an activity, you need to tell me what it's referred to. Because this number doesn't make any sense if you didn't give me this, right? Because what physically matters is the chemical potential. Yes, camera, here we go. So if you tell me the activity is 0.5, that means squat to me if you didn't tell me what the reference state is, right? because the activity relates the chemical potential in your state to the chemical potential in the reference state. 
So it's like a, you can almost think of it as a zero of, of, of chemical potential, right? So activity only has meaning for a given reference. So let's make models. So I'm going to ask you to think about what this equation looks like for an ideal gas. And if you can't do it, ask Jenya. Bother him at office hours um, or in discussion section. But if my species is an ideal gas mixture, I want you to figure out what the activity looks like. Where did my black go? Oh, here we go. Okay, let's make models for activity. Uh, the basic model for activity, most simple model is what's called Raoultian behavior. And this is mimicked after gases where the activity of a species is set equal to the mole fraction. And remember what I told you, this has no meaning if I don't tell you the reference state. And this is when the reference state is pure I. So what this is kind of telling you physically, right, is that the chemical potential only depends on the dilution of the species. So if I go back to my chemical potential equation, I would really be telling you like the chemical potential of I is some number, some fixed number, which doesn't depend on composition and then depends logarithmically on the dilution, right? Because AI now becomes XI. So it's a strong statement, right? Because it's telling you whatever else is in there doesn't matter. There's no dependence on the J's on all the other components, right? With that mech, you're probably going to see that this tends to be, it's going to be good for like things that don't interact, right? If, if I doesn't really interact much with J, then it really doesn't depend on the composition of J. But we'll sort of prove that more elaborately later. So that's Raoultian behavior. And I'll show you some cases later. Um, okay. If Raoultian behavior does, doesn't work, what do you come up with? So you're a 1940s metallurgist and you find that Raoultian is not good enough and your name is Henry. So what do you do when Raoultian behavior is not good enough? You introduce a fudge factor, right? So. I, I'm sorry, this is much more fun in real class because then everybody screams it out. So you set the activity equal to some correction factor. And uh, Henry was the first smart guy to come up with this. And so this is called Henry's behavior and gamma, sometimes called K as well in some books, is called the activity coefficient. And I'm sorry I have to walk you through this, but unfortunately you will meet people who will talk to you in this language. And, and if you don't know what it is, you're gonna put us to shame in Berkeley. So we have to help, we have to suffer you through this. Okay. And in Henry's behavior specifically, the activity coefficient is constant. Because of course, like if this doesn't work, you know, if Henry didn't do his job right, right? What's the next you do? You activity right okay so there are certain limits to the activity um the first one is easy right the activity has to be one when xi is one if you take the reference state as pure and that's because then the logarithm has to die because if I'm in a pure state and that's my reference state, 
So mu i in the pure state has to be equal to mu i not. That means the activity has to be one. So in the pure state, the activity has to be one. And a little more subtle, but the activity has to be zero when x i equals zero. Okay, so I um, should have written that on this board. If all species are Raoultian, so So it's called an ideal solution or an ideal mixture. So if AI is XI, that's the definition of an ideal solution. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop here and uh, I was gonna do an example, but I think we're not gonna have time to do it. So I'll do it actually on Friday, Monday. Okay, so thank you for uh, sticking with this. Um, enjoy your weekend and uh, I'll see you on Monday. Take care. Lion King says, take care. Bye. Thanks.